Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti and I'm going to be talking to you today about the last part of cell respiration, the last part of aerobic cell respiration, which is the electron transport, the electron transport chain, the electron transport system. And this is going to be the culmination of three biochemical pathways that we've been considering, well, that I've been considering uh, two videos ago. So one on glycolysis, one on the Krebs cycle, and this one is going to be principally about the electron transport system. So let's jump right into that. So out of respiration involves three metabolic uh, reactions, glycolysis, Krebs, and the electron transport system. And as you can see here, glycolysis is occurring in the cytoplasm, the Krebs cycle is occurring in the mitochondrial matrix, and the electron transport chain is going to occur in the inner membrane inside the mitochondria. And so uh, the electron transport chain is, is uh, associated with the oxidative phosphorylation or a massive amount of production of ATP. If you've watched the previous videos, you'll know in terms of your ATP ledger, you'll know that 2 ATP, not so much, was produced during glycolysis and 2 ATP were produced in the Krebs cycle, both of those through substrate level phosphorylation. But the electron transport chain is going to generate a lot of potential for extracting really most of the energy from glucose. And so that's what this video is all about, is looking at that process. So just a little review of the anatomy of the mitochondria, if you need it. The outer membrane is uh, composed of a phospholipid bilayer, and there's lots of proteins embedded, but there's an inner layer, and that inner layer inside the mitochondria is extremely convoluted, and, that, and, and with all these uh, folds. So that inner membrane, there's a lot more inner membrane than outer membrane, and, and that's going to be really significant because it's the inner membrane is where the electron transport system occurs. So literally, the electron transport system is occurring everywhere you see that inner membrane. And I should also mention what is of significance is that space right in here uh, between the inner membrane and the outer membrane, it's known as the intermembrane space. So this space is going to be rather important as well. And so what's going to happen just in general is we're going to turn our mitochondria into a little bit of a battery. And you might be surprised that that's possible, but that is possible. The energy from food, and this is what's really cool. And I, you know, it's one thing getting into the detail of it, but it's 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 even more important to be in awe of it or or think that it's exciting. The food that we eat, we're going to pull the energy from the food we eat through um, oxidation, and basically convert that energy that was once in the chemical bonds of of glucose, and we're going to store it in the form of electrochemical gradient, which is a battery inside the mitochondria, and then we're going to use that battery to generate a large quantity of ATP. How is that possible? Well, the inner membrane of the mitochondria is where that electron transport chain or transport system is occurring. And it has to do with the electron transport chain, and it has to do with a really, really interesting enzyme called ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is actually responsible for production of ATP. So again, in terms of like that ATP, uh, only four have been produced so far, and so 38 ultimately can be produced uh, for every glucose. And so most of the energy that uh, is in uh, ATP uh, comes from, or that, that is being produced from glucose, is coming from these electron carriers right here. And so this is where the energy is coming from. And you're like, well, I thought you were talking about glucose producing the energy to, to make ATP. Well, I was, but during the Krebs cycle, the energy of the food that we're eating is converted to these reduced coenzymes. And so that's where the energy is going to be coming from to power the production of ATP. So what may seem sort of abstract will be made clear, I, I hope. So the energy of these electrons are used uh, in the electron transport system to produce a, a large quantity of ATP. And so again, where we are is that we're in this inner membrane right here. And so here's the matrix. And so this is where the Krebs cycle is occurring right there. 
And so the Krebs cycle, as you may know, uh, I try to emphasize it, its main job is to produce a large amount of these reduced coenzymes called NADH and FADH2. And so in the Christie, however, there's thousands of copies. And so what, what are what copies of what? There's proteins embedded in the inner membrane. And I think you might be familiar with the fact that when you have a phospholipid bilayer, it's possible to have proteins embedded in that phospholipid bilayer. And so these proteins are rather unique. So these proteins are embedded and the more membrane that you have inside your inner membrane, the more potential you have to produce ATP. And so thus you have these extensive surface area and folds inside the mitochondria. It's really, really cool. And so that's gonna be what we're gonna be talking about. And so here's a picture of the inner membrane, so as, as I was attempting to draw. So here's the phospholipid bilayer, and these are proteins that are embedded. And so this is what we mean by the electron transport chain. And you're like, well, I don't quite see why this would be called an electron transport chain. All I see is uh, integral proteins that are embedded in the inner membrane. Well, what's interesting is there are some coenzymes that are associated with these proteins. And again, to refresh you what a coenzyme is, is a small vitamin-like molecule that's organic, that's in this case, very electronegative. And so they're like little uh, prosthetic groups. And I'll just draw them in like this, little coenzymes that are present in the proteins in the inner membrane. Okay, and so this is what I mean. Here's a protein that's embedded in the, in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Draw some phospholipids for context. There we go, like that. And so here's a protein embedded in the inner membrane. And so this right in here is a coenzyme. Coenzyme. And a coenzyme is gonna be really important in this conversation because being that it's electronegative, it's capable of causing a substrate to lose electrons. And so that is going to be the heart and soul of the electron transport chain. Because if I spill it right now, I'll let you know what's going on. In other words, the electron transport chain is going to be a series of redox reactions, one after the other, where one coenzyme causes the other to become oxidized and then be reduced and then oxidized and then be reduced. So it's a chain, one being more aggressively electronegative than the other, okay? And so let's take a look at that. So most of these proteins that are embedded in the Christi are, uh, what, most of these molecules are, uh, are proteins and they have these prosthetic groups and they can alternate between whether or not when they gain electrons. Gaining electrons is reduction. So they be become reduced. And then if they get their electrons stolen away, then they're oxidized. Or Leo, losing electrons is oxidation. Leo says Ger. Okay, so they rotate or alternate between these states, whether or not they're accepting or donating. And so just to show you a little bit, this would be like the protein part over here. And this is a, uh, a coenzyme, a, a great example of a coenzyme would be a cytochrome, a cytochrome C, for example, and it has this heme group inside. And so it's extremely electronegative. This cysteine is showing the amino acid right here where the, the disulfite bridge, uh, this is the R group of cysteine and amino acid. So it's, so it's disulfite bridges that are holding the cytochrome C in, in, the, in the protein right here, as you can see. And so all of these uh, electron transport proteins are found in the inner membrane. So I can just start putting them in there like little beads in the inner membrane. And so what I was saying is the more inner membrane that you can have, the more potential energy that you can create. Okay, so these electrons are basically metaphorically dropping. Okay, so if you had a staircase like this, they're basically dropping. So in other words, here's a substrate. You're gonna go from uh, losing electrons, gaining electrons. 
losing electrons, gaining electrons, losing electrons, gaining electrons. And so it's going to be a drop of free energy as those electrons are passed along the chain. And then ultimately, who's going to be catching the electrons from, this was food, ultimately, if you trace it all the way back, who's going to be catching the electrons? Oxygen. You might have been wondering if you'd been watching the previous video on glycolysis and Krebs cycle. You might be, I'm not sure, it might be taking it too far, but where's the oxygen? I, I thought aerobic cell respiration was all about the burning of glucose with oxygen. We haven't even mentioned it yet. Well, it, it's, it's kind of ironic because it occurs at the very final, the very final chemical reaction of the electron transport chain is where oxygen's present. And so as we could see it here, Okay, so we're inside the, the matrix, okay? If I were to be able to draw this, okay, we're inside the matrix. And what's interesting is the inner membrane, okay? The inner membrane contains these proteins right here. This is the electron transport chain. And the, do you remember inside the matrix right up here is where the Krebs cycle is going it's going down okay so here's the Krebs cycle like this it's going around going around going around and the principal product of the Krebs cycle is is to take the energy in substrates through redox reactions and store them in these reduced coenzymes NADH and FADH2 and so in the Christie however there's a an enzyme, a dehydrogenase enzyme, a protein, that it's going to house a coenzyme that is even more electronegative. And so flavin mononucleotide is a coenzyme that's very electronegative. And what's going to happen is it's going to cause, because it's an oxidizing agent, it's going to cause NADH to lose electrons. And so doing, it becomes NAD plus. And so we're going to now draw the electrons. And so that's a loss of energy. And so what's, this is now going to become reduced. And then this coenzyme, which is adjacent to it, is going to steal the electrons away. So it's going to be causing, this is the oxidizing agent, it's now going to be reduced. So FMN becomes oxidized uh, again. And then UB quinum, and so it goes down the line like this, oxidation reduction, oxidation reduction. FADH2 enters in a little bit lower in terms of the free energy. So oxidation reduction, oxidation reduction. So it's like passing the hot potato. It's passing down through these protein complexes and coenzymes ultimately to get to cytochrome C down here. Uh, and what's happening is this is going to lose its electrons to oxygen, and in so doing, it's going to produce water. And so this is what we mean by the electron transport chain. It's passing the electrons down. So the electrons are carried first by these reduced coenzymes that are produced. The truth is there's, uh, there's two of them, two of NADHs that are producing glycolysis as well, and there's also two NADHs that are produced in the formation of acetyl-CoA. But most of them are produced in the Krebs cycle. So this energy, potential energy, uh, is going to get its electrons ripped from it, and it's going to travel down these several proteins, which include uh, cytochromes, which are coenzymes that are electronegative, which are going to steal those electrons. And so ultimately, the electrons that are carried by, I mentioned this, by FADH2 or have a lower energy, and so they're added a little bit lower in the chain. And so just a big sort of a sky cam view of what's going on. So do you see the, the light yellow right in here? The light yellow is referring to the matrix. And the matrix is where the NADH is being produced in the first place in the Krebs cycle. And so do you see this dark, dark orange out here? Dark orange is out here. So this is the inner membrane space. And so check this out. This is significant. So as the electrons, which are carried electrons from food ultimately, as NADH is donating those electrons, in other words, it's being oxidized, and the coenzymes being reduced, that's a loss of energy. This is an important point. That loss of energy 
allows, and, and again, the hydride is what's being transferred. And there's protons uh, that are also produced as a result of the, of the oxidation. That provides the necessary energy to scoot protons in the inner mitochondrial membrane space. So every time there's a redox reaction, there's an opportunity to push for free because energy is, is being generated as a result of the redox reaction. It allows protons, I know protons, a single proton or H plus is the symbol of that, to accumulate in the inner membrane space. So what I'm getting at is this, that this area out here is becoming very concentrated in hydrogen ions. And I said, what area? This dark area has become really concentrated in hydrogen ions. So much so that if you're familiar with your chemistry, this, this would mean to you something significant. It's getting pretty acidic out here. So in other words, the pH is lowering out here. So the, if the concentration is higher outside than inside, there's a chemical gradient that's starting to develop. So it's more concentrated out here and less in here because they're being shuttled out. As a result of this, you know, these are positively charged. So what happens is there's a positive charge on the outside area and a negative charge on the inside. This is called a membrane potential. So what's happening as a result of the redox reactions and the protons being pushed in the inner space is you're, you've created a membrane potential and a concentration gradient. Collectively, both of those are called an electrochemical gradient. And so you've created a battery. The mitochondria is now a battery. And you're like, a battery, like why don't the protons come back in? They cannot come back in because they're ions. And so therefore they're trapped. They don't pass through phospholipid bilayer. They're trapped out there. It's kind of like putting water in the top of a water tower. It's trapping that potential energy, okay? So that, that's kind of interesting. I'll, I'll get to this concept over here about the generation of ATP in a moment. So what's happening here, just to summarize, is that the electrons from NADH, right over here, NADH, this has energy in the form of electrons. What's going to happen is it's going to be oxidized, and that means losing electrons. And so these coenzymes are going to then be reduced. So they're gaining the electron. And then adjacent to it, is another coenzyme, and that's going to cause this coenzyme to be oxidized and then this one reduced. And so that's a transfer of electrons, but it's also a loss of energy. And then ultimately it's going to be passed down to oxygen. And so the electron transport itself doesn't generate any ATP directly. And I'll, get, I'll get to what that means in a moment. Its function is, really is to so, sort of slowly, like a staircase, so sometimes analogies are like, well, you know, just helping me understand it. But in this case, it's rather significant. The electron transport chain, it, is, it's, it attempts to sort of break the free fall of energy. There's too much potential energy in glucose to, for, it to, for the cell to cope with it. And so if it's able to release energy step by step by step in the electron transport chain, and, it, and it's able to uh, harness that in a more manageable amount, and that's kind of cool. So it's like the electrons are sort of falling down the steps as opposed to dropping something down a big staircase. And so, again, back to this picture, um, uh, this would be, like, uh, if I extend this, this would be the inside. This would be the matrix right in here. Here's the matrix. So the matrix, because of the Krebs cycles, making lots of NADH. So in this inner membrane space, it's getting really positive, and inside it's, it's getting rather negative. So inside here it's negative, out there it's positive. Now all of these protons building up, building up, building up are itching to get back in. And so as it turns out, they can come back in. There is a proton there is a proton transport protein that will allow protons to diffuse back into the mitochondrial matrix. And in so doing, this is really important, in so doing, 
when these positive charges travel down this protein, what it does is the positive charges influence the tertiary conformation of this enzyme called ATP synthase. And in so doing, it's pretty cool. When the protons come flowing through, it literally causes the protein to oscillate and move around like a turbine, moving and moving, which generates the kinetic movement energy necessary for the enzyme to grab inorganic phosphate and stick it onto ADP to produce copious amounts of ATP. And we call that oxidative phosphorylation because ultimately what happened was the electron transport chain as a result of passing the electrons all the way down to oxygen picks it up and it produces water so water is a product of the electron transport chain but it's oxidative and you need oxygen to, to drive the electron transport chain but the electron transport chain doesn't make ATP it's the accumulation of the protons that flow back into the matrix. This is referred to as the proton motive force that pulls it in. Sometimes it's even referred to as chemiosmosis because osmosis, everyone's familiar with the movement of water from an area of high concentration. Of so it's a chemical osmosis, the chemiosmosis. It's fun. Um, when you take a look at the mitochondria here, again, let me see if I can animate it. Let's go yellow. Uh, so these protons that were, the proteins that we're discussing in the electron transport chain are located in the inner membrane. So here is a large amount of NADH, and what's happening is the NADH is going to be losing electrons, and then oxidation reduction, oxidation reduction, oxidation reduction. So this is what we mean by the electron transport system or electron transport chain. As a result of that loss of energy, protons are accumulating here in, in the inner membrane space. Okay, inner membrane space, lots of protons. So it's getting kind of positive out there, getting kind of negative. So there's a separation of charge which is generating, and it, this is referred to as the electrochemical gradient. Sure, and then one of the, one of the, uh, and I'm going to emphasize it with green. One of the pro proteins embedded has an enzyme associated with it called ATP synthase. And so as these protons flow back across into the matrix, that generates a motion which will allow ADP to get a phosphate to become ATP. And this is referred to as chemiosmosis, or oxidative phosphorylation, because the electron transport system generates a proton gradient, which then, when it flows back through, back into the matrix, generates the physical energy by spinning the protein around, and therefore allowing AT, ADP to, to gain ATP. And a major amount, 34 ATP, are produced in this, in this manner. So it, when I say really cool, I, I'm, I really mean it. Uh, I am, have a tendency to, have, to be uh, prone to hyperbole. Everything to me seems interesting or fascinating. I apologize for this. But this, I think most, most people would agree, is quite remarkable. Again, I, I remember studying this uh, uh, when I was an undergraduate at the University of California, Davis, and this is, we, we were learning this as Mitchell's hypothesis. It was quite unclear uh, exactly what was happening. And, and what's interesting is it, it's still subject to further, uh, further learning, which is a, a lesson to us all. But these protons are flowing through these uh, protein subunits, which are literally like a magnet because of the positive charge influencing the R groups causing them to rotate around and around and around, which is then ultimately inter, uh, affecting the, this uh, ATP synthase, which is then capable of taking a phosphate, sticking it onto ADP to make ATP. And so it's literally like cruising around. I gotta, I gotta show you this. Like I have a, a, little, a little video of, of that process. You gotta check that out. So over here, I've got, this is a, a really cool animation of 
of the enzyme itself just rotating like that. Look at that. That's totally awesome. So because of the protons, here's another one, because of the protons moving through it, bring this over here, because of the, <laughs> sorry, I'll just go with it. Because the proteins are moving through it, it's allowing the, the, the enzyme to actually move and therefore it's able to function. It's pretty, pretty awesome. I think it's pretty cool. So again, let's check, let's check this out. So here's oxidative phosphorylation or the electron, electron carrier well, such as let me turn off the narration. So this is kind of busy. Let me back it up just for a second. Okay, there we go. So what's happening here in the video is, okay, here's an electron carrier. So this is NADH. Okay, so notice we're in the matrix. Okay. And so what's going to happen is it's going to lose electrons. And as a result of that oxidation, that provides the energy necessary to pump these protons, which are shown here in blue, from the matrix to the inner membrane space. And so this is going to be kind of busy, but can you imagine how quickly it actually occurs? So electrons, are, are, which are shown in, in yellow, are going to be bouncing down the, electro, the electron transport chain, going from uh, lo losing free energy, but going to always a more electronegative molecule, and ultimately oxygen is going to pick them up. Let's check it out. So as you can see here, um, this one's pretty cool because it actually travels inside the, the, the uh, phospholipid bilayer. But notice here all these protons that are accumulating out here in the inner membrane space as a result of the electron transport system. So the electron transport system itself isn't making any ATP. And so it's just a, a series of redox reactions in which w electrons are passed from one coenzyme to another. But as a result, the electrons get moved on to oxygen to produce water. So when you're breathing out water, there it is. It's the result of the electron transport chain. So all of these protons are accumulating out here, and then when they flow back in, watch this, there's the positively charged protons, and when they flow back in, it causes the protein to move, and as a result, ATP synthase is capable of adding an inorganic phosphate onto ADP to produce ATP. This is known as chemiosmosis. So pretty awesome, and all of that is occurring all through the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Okay. So just to summarize some of the things that we've been talking about is um, this proton gradient, again, that is generated as a result of the electron transport chain produces a proton motive force. And that proton motive force is rather powerful because when it passes in back to the matrix, it is able to generate a large amount of ATP. So when ATP synthase uh, is embedded in that membrane, what's going to happen is the flow of protons are then used by the enzyme to ge generate the energy needed to produce ATP. And so that backflow, th I like this diagram a lot, the electron transport chain is generating the proton motive force, which is then allowing the chemiosmotic production of ATP. And so this is different than substrate level phosphorylation, which is this is a simple transfer of a phosphate from one substrate to another. And so this mechanism of ATP uh, generation is, is awesome. ATP synthase is able to rotate as a result of the protons coming in. And so um, it's an area of active investigation, to, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier. And so cell respiration um, generates ultimately a lot of ATP, but a little bit during glycolysis, a little bit during the Krebs cycle, but most of it comes from oxidative phosphorylation because it involves oxygen. Oxygen is really pulling the whole thing. It's like, you're like, well, oxygen never really encountered NADH. No, but it caused the molecule right above it to lose electrons. And so ultimately, it was oxygen that was pulling the, the, the string all the way back to glucose. Oxygen was really the one, okay? And so oxidative phosphorylation produces 90% of the ATP generated in, ATP, in uh, cell respiration, aerobic cell respiration. And so respiration is broken up in these small steps because 
uh, I mentioned glucose has, has a lot of potential energy. And so uh, the quantity of energy in ATP, you, you might wonder, you know, what, what's the whole point in the first place? Well, um, there's a video that I've, that I've produced on ATP that, that I think would be essential to watch if you have this question. But ATP is what really powers chemical reactions in the cell. It, it provides an appropriate, which is a smaller amount, of energy necessary to, uh, to move cilia or transport molecules in the cell or contract the muscle. But ultimately, 38 ATP are produced. Um, there's six CO2s and six waters that are produced as a result of cell respiration. And so here's the whole thing. Um, we're talking about thir approximately 38 ATP are produced in the process two and then four and then 34 uh, producing. And then all of that energy is coming from reduced coenzymes, mostly produced in the Krebs cycle. And so how efficient is it? Well, you know, just to throw out some trivia uh, numbers, because they're kind of interesting, uh, glucose itself releases 686 kilocalories per mole. And just at one ATP only requires seven, approximately 7.3. So when you think about it, when you look at the efficiency of it and the number of ATP that are produced, then it comes out to a 40% uh, efficiency. And I, I know that doesn't sound too great, but it's pretty good. And so 60% uh, of the energy when, when glucose is burned is lost in the form of heat or entropy. Um, so it's a reminder of how inefficient some things are in terms of like when you're converting from one trophic energy to another and this ultimately comes down to the reason behind that and then so sort of to conclude uh, one last uh, review of this process and so all these electron carriers are really providing ultimately the wherewithal to produce the ATP in in the electron transport chain and so um, those are produced as a result of redox reactions but then, now that you have all of that NADH, what are you going to do with it? Well, you're going to have that be oxidized. And so the beginning of the electron transport chain is the oxidation of NAD back into NAD+. Plus. Okay? And so now those electrons get passed on, but the energy is necessary to, again, shuttle those protons into the inner membrane space. So as the electron transport system goes along, the protons are pushed out, and then those electrons unite with water, I mean, I'm sorry, unite with oxygen to produce water. And so water is a product of aerobic cellular respiration. So the electron transport chain, and there's a lot of them because there's a lot of inner membrane, generates something called the proton motive force. Uh, all those protons out there make it rather acidic. It's rather positive. The inside of the matrix is rather negative. Collectively, this is called an electrochemical gradient. Then the protons move across ATP synthase, which then causes it to move and produce a lot of ATP. And so that production, as a result of the, the chemiosmotic movement of protons back into the matrix, is known as oxidative phosphorylation. And you produce, ultimately, 38 ATP. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion of the electron transport chain, which is the third part of aerobic cell respiration. Thanks for watching.